Kala Jojo, or why? Why is black storytelling important, Kala? Why is black storytelling important? Um, telling stories of, of, uh, of African American people are very, very important. One reason is because of uh, that old adage, uh, you need to know your story. Everyone needs to know their story. Um, when one knows their story, they tend to come and be empowered. Um, one of the reasons why I tell stories is because I had a, an incident when I was a young child um, where uh, I wasn't really able to articulate some things that I wanted to say and I kind of recall on that, that, whole, that whole feeling. Um, our stories need to be told, they need to be yelled out loud as much as possible. Uh, if you look at the books uh, that are in schools, children are getting exposed to everything except our culture. They're getting exposed to on the, on the surface level, not on the gut level. They need to know uh, the, 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 the stories behind uh, a lot of the significant events that have happened uh, within our society. So I consider myself to be what they call a gatekeeper of the culture. So I tell traditional style stories. I tell stories about Mr. Blue who lived down on the, on the avenue. I tell stories about uh, famous uh, people, uh, African epic stories, uh, song stories. Uh, at every juncture, just stories about world African people as much as possible. Our children need to hear it over and over and over and over and over and over again. What do you think makes a good storyteller? Um, well, there are a few different things. One good thing that makes a good storyteller is the fact is, is someone who's, who's effective in terms of uh, speaking, articulation, um, one who has, I guess, a, who's a humanness a kind of person who can identify with any type of audience, regardless if they're African children or uh, African American adults or, or white or whoever it is. Uh, storytellers have to be uh, have to have a universalist. Uh, 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 demeanor about themselves. They, they need to be able to communicate, the, you know, across the cultural lines, the religious lines. Uh, 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 they just need to be an effective uh, person, you know, to be a storyteller. I think that's one of the most uh, powerful attributes of storytelling. And, and what would you say would make a good story? I mean, you hear a lot of stories, but what is a really good story? Uh, Good story for me is a story that plays or that touches the emotion. Stories about uh, overcoming. Stories about rising above some type of adversity or something that you had. Some stories about love, uh, uh, regaining love. I mean, and even stories about losing love because there's a situation where people have lost love and in hearing a story about losing love, it's sort of, uh, it might go. It, it might be an array of emotions. At first, it, it might remind them, "Wow, that happened to me," but like that. But in the end, this you know, this person was triumphant, and, and, and love. It's a song out. Love has finally come. I think Luther Vandross, "Love has finally come." So you know, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's so many different, so many different aspects of, of, of a good story. So you think um, lesson stories are without important? a doubt, without a doubt, every story has to have a purpose and intent and a lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, a lesson. You know, something you can identify with and attach it to you. You know, attach it to yourself. Well, we often hear the term "pass it on." What does that s slogan mean to you? A passing pass on. So why do you think it's important? Yes. Passing it on is like. Um, it's like, to me, when I think about passing something on, I think about a river. I think about a, a stream. And for whatever reason, there might be a rock there. And the first person that came there might want to go across that stream, but uh, it was just one rock there, okay? So what this person did, maybe they put down another rock and they swam the rest of the way. Next person might come, he see two rocks, or she see two rocks. She might put one down and swim the rest of the way until there's just a, a steady flow of rocks mm -hmm. so the person don't have to get in the water, don't have to get wet. They can just walk across. That's, yeah. to me, that's, what's, that's, that's building. You know, that's, that's building. That's, that's passing the stories on so they won't be forgotten. Raising up those images of our people during our time of greatness, 
mm -hmm. uh, when we do great things, when we do good things, you know, talking about our accomplishments, um, uh, restoring, um, you know, people talk about oh, down south, we used to do this, I mean, yeah, they do this down south, but up north people did, did it was a time when people did it up north too, because a lot of those people that were down south moved up here to the mm -hmm. north. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding, for, to me, is that that's the image that I get, you know consistently telling those stories to our children so they can hear them and they can take them and expand upon them so that their children's children will know um, uh, where once they came and, uh, and they'll have an easier time right, maybe they might right. have a not a hardest time as their ancestors did right it'll be right. a little bit easier for them right to uplift their that, children that, right? that's that's the mm -hmm. hope that's the dream yeah. okay what storytellers do you admire oh okay uh, uh, well um, of course, Bobby Jamal Karam, that's, that's my main man. Um, uh, Karen, I would mean, uh, it's, it's a lot of great storytellers. I get in trouble asking me questions like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, well, we'll I, There's so many, well, all right. hey, there's, hey, there's so I, many I, great storytellers. I you, know you don't want to get in any more trouble, saying, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> When did you join Keepers of the Culture yourself? I came into Coty, I believe it was 92. I think it was 92. It might have been my daughter was born. It was maybe 92 or 93. I know my, my daughter was really small. And um, it's, it's really interesting just in the way that, that I came about telling stories. I was telling stories somewhere in Jawara and. Uh, um, a sister named um, Rose, Audrey Rose, they were somewhere and they saw me and they said, you know we have a storytelling group here in Philly. Okay. I was like, oh yeah, you have to come to a meeting. So I okay. came to a meeting and, I, and it was, it was like really exciting because I got to see all these people doing this stuff that, that I, didn't really, I didn't have a clue about, you know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. And then uh, I found out there was a national organization and I was like, wow, this is awesome. So this story, and storytelling for me was like a, a, a lifesaver. You know, I find so much peace in it, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just my life. It's not, you know, it's not like something that I put on, okay, I'm a storyteller today. I always walk around in that mode of, of, uh, of how to create a, a, a new story. When I go somewhere and I talk to these children, what could I say to them that's going to be profound? What could I say to them so that when I leave out of here, they're going to remember it and it can maybe help them uh, uh, solve some kind of challenge or something that they're having with their friends or right. maybe with your mom or dad or whatever. So Cozy to me and storytelling and NABS to me is like, uh, I mean, it's like beans is to rice. It's, 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 the, it's the best thing that could have possibly happened to me. And ever since I've been telling stories, uh, I haven't did a day's work since. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, though, right? It's hard work, y'all. Don't watch the tape. It's hard work, but I, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kala Jojo, the tall storyteller. I, sure. I want to congratulate a few folks and just uh, all the people that have been a support to me, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is all of you all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, I'm lucky. The other yeah. guys from other cities, they they, they just they <laughs> don't know what to do. Uh, you know, Coty, you know, we sometimes we get fragmented. Yeah, yeah. But we get busy. Yeah, we get busy doing, doing other things. Other things yeah, and, right, and this is our right, way of right. life, so we got to right. be staying busy and doing right, other things. Right, but when right. we do come together, it's always something powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know that's, Coty is my extended family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a, 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 um, basically just as good a relationship with many of the members in Coty as I have with my, 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 my siblings, my birth siblings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I always want, I want to send kudos out to everybody, to everybody that's doing it, that's working. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, Karen, she's always working and doing things and reaches out to help anybody. Mama Sandy, um, uh, Tahira. Um, um, Carly's, you know, Charlotte, my girl, she's always, you know, moving and grooving, always willing to help out. Um, Jawara, she's, she's a sweetheart. She's, 
my sister, but she, Joel got that mother energy about her too, her and uh, Irma. Yeah. And, she, yeah, you know, Shirley, did. of course, she, 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 Shirley's, you know, she's our uh, archives person, yourself, you know, beautiful, beautiful sister, always willing to help me out from the day I met you. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's just a, a reciprocal thing that goes on, I guess, within and the members of, of uh, Cozy. Also, the two brothers, Rob and uh, and, and, and Nasheed. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm thankful for that they came because yeah. prior to them, I was the only, my, me and Isaac and brothers had came, but for some reason, they'd have it. Stay, yeah. but we're going to get some more brothers. Yeah, we have Nate Palm the Bomb. Right, see, yeah. I never met him. Oh, well, Nate Palm is a I bad I I poet. Yeah, yeah, he's a good poet, and he tells story yeah. in his poetry, yeah. so you. You'll but then we got, we got Granddaddy yeah, and Bob right. tomorrow, too. That's like. right. Let's not forget our... <laughs> and Bob Jones. Yeah, let's not forget our international, <laughs> right. our national yeah, brothers. Yeah, that's that's right. right. So we're not that's doing right. too bad. Yeah. Well, thanks, Kyle. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing with me. All I think right. it's going to be real beautiful when we pull this together. Yeah, we'll okay. pull that thing together. Make me look yeah. nice, too, because I'm look, real tired. You look good. I, I ain't got to work too hard. All right. All right. Let me see. <laughs>we're here we're at the National Association of Black Storytellers Conference and we would like to ask you a few questions and um, you being from Chicago and traveled all over telling stories we'd like to know what makes a good storyteller honesty I think that's the number one thing in storytelling the storyteller has to be who he or she is and has to tell in a style that reflects who they are and their own experience. If you try to emulate someone else to the point of becoming someone else or telling someone else's story in his or her words or his or her mannerisms, I think an audience can tell that you're not being honest. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. There is there's a triangle. There's the storyteller, the story, and the audience. And all three must be in sync. But without honesty, nothing works. Ooh, that's good. Okay, so what do you think makes a good story? Well, that triangle that I talked to you about with the storyteller, the story, and the audience, um, a good story includes the audience. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to move or, or do something, but you have to make sure you are pulling them into the story. I think what makes storytelling uh, very special is that we really do communicate. We're not reciting something that we've simply memorized. We can tell a story, we can adjust it as we go along, we can feel the audience and what their reaction is, and we can adjust and change and, and improvise as we go on. And the audience can tell when you're doing that, and they can tell when you are truly responding to them. Um, and that makes that experience memorable. Um, and then once again, you have the story, which has to be well-crafted, there's no doubt about that. Um, a story has to have a a clear beginning, a clear ending, and you have to know how you're going to get to from those two, from the first one to the second one. Um, and I think the audience has to feel safe about that. They have to feel as if the teller knows where he or she is going. Um, and then that makes the audience safe, and then the audience gets pulled in. So a safe audience that's pulled in with an honest storyteller, and then you got to have some fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right, you some, have fun. some fun. Right, right. Well, um, what, is, what is a favorite story you have? What do you think? Do you have a certain style or do you have a certain type of story that you like to tell? Yes, there's no question. I think everybody probably does. When I tell my stories, I like to include the audience. I like to have them do something. It could be anything depending on what the story is. But I like to have them um, feeling as if they're part of it. So I usually have them doing something or saying mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do it to excess, but I think... Um, audiences, no matter whether they're very young or very old, they still want to feel pulled in, and they feel pulled in when they're part of the experience. Mm -hmm. So my favorite stories would be stories, um, generally they're folk tales, um, generally they're pretty simple in the, in the way the story is pretty much crafted, um, generally they are interactive, and generally they have a fair amount of laughter, or hopefully people a fair amount of laughter, a fair amount of fun. Oh, okay. 
Okay, great. Now, do you think there's any, do you do any story that's just like indigenous to your area, or do you tell international tales, or do you tell just African-American stories? What, what kind of stories when people say, well, I'm going to call Linda Gorman, why would they call you as opposed to another storyteller? Uh, why would they call me? Because mm -hmm. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, you have to have confidence, I tell you, this I, is I not... Think, I think when they call me, they say, her audiences feel, uh, her audiences are always excited when she's there. Her audiences feel as if she's really relating to them. I think they feel um, that she's going to have a little bit of a edge to her performance. I may throw in some innuendos or some words or some some something a little gross or something a little off the wall that makes people go, oh, I don't believe she said that. <laughs> and so it makes sure that I'm making sure I keep it with me. Right, right. Um, you know, I think that uh, that level of uh, energy that I bring to it, people always say, you can do four performances in a row and your energy never seems to to, fa to fall down. And well, that's because the audience can energize me and I can keep going as long as they're with me. Right, right, that's great. Thank you for blazing the way for people like me. Mm -hmm. Because if it wasn't those, if it weren't for those people like Linda Goss and Charlotte Gray Goss and Diane Ferlot, and Diane was one of the people who I saw and she blew me away and I said, if, if I could ever mesmerize an audience the way she does, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will be thrilled. Those are people who help perpetuate an art that's been going on for a long time mm -hmm. but is in competition with television and it's in competition with PlayStation, it's a competition with videos and movies, and they kept it alive, mm -hmm. and they educated people, and now we are able to come along and, come and add to that education, but somebody had to get people started, someone had to get people excited about this, and have people understand the value of keeping stories alive, mm -hmm. and the value of talking to people. Right. Um, you know, we don't do that that much. Right. You know, Diane Ferlot in a, in, a, in a show today mentioned how we communicate by typing into a, a computer. Right. We're, we lost the art of writing a, st a letter. Um, we lost the art of spelling. We, we lost a piece of communication um, in that respect. And I, I'm so glad that we're not losing the art of telling our stories. Our parents have always done it. And they've always told the stories of their parents. And we heard them and we said, oh, okay, Ma, I've heard it 16,000 times. But thank goodness, I'm grateful to my mother for what stories she did tell me. And, I, um, and I'm happy to be able to um, share those stories and stories from folklore and stories that I might create. And um, I'm happy to see people use their imaginations. And I'm happy to see people get excited about one person standing in front of an audience talking for 45 minutes and people are excited. People's imaginations have been fueled. People's energies have been aroused. People are excited. People are, are feeling good. People are feeling like they want to now share a story with somebody else. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Hi, my name is Ramona King, a storyteller. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas been telling stories for about 10, 13 years now, maybe. Um, and I have a big fam, well, a nice, precious family. Yeah, so do you tell stories about your family, Ramona? I've just started telling stories about my family. I've just begun telling stories about my family. Um, in particular, I'm not going to tell you the stories, but in particular, um, I found it necessary to begin telling those stories because just recently, I um, came in contact with family members I knew nothing about. I was on a search to find a grandmother that I hadn't, um, that I heard about but never did meet. And I met her about five years ago. And so um, I began to see how history, how each person's history is so significant to who that person is, in particular who I am. And so yes, I'm telling family stories now. Okay, so when did you first start, how long ago have you been telling stories? Let's see, um, family stories are just in general. Just in general, just as a yeah. storyteller, because everyone yeah. says, oh, I'm a storyteller, but how long have you been a storyteller? Yeah. yeah, I've been telling stories for, let's see, 
like I said, 13 years, I, I have, um, I started off with folklore. Okay. Telling African folklore, mm -hmm. African American folklore, and uh, Native American coyote stories. I love coyote. Okay. My grandmother reminds me of, 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 of a person who likes to tell on coyotes. Right. Sometimes she reminds me of coyote. <laughs> <laughs> coyote okay. is really strange. Uh -huh. Funny. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Well, you know more about them than me. <laughs> So what made you sort of change up? What are you doing here at the National Association of Black Storytellers? The people here are wonderful. And I get so much um, energy um, just by being in the presence of these wonderful storytellers. Everyone has such, each person has such a different background. And the energy and the, uh, that radiates from each person. And I've, I've received wisdom. It's like being in the midst of a bunch of prophets and wow. <laughs> spiritual people. No, seriously, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. each person has something so special and, and wonderful to share with you about themselves. And sometimes they're talking about you and have no idea that they're talking to you directly about your life, things that you're dealing with, things that you need to deal with. So I've always found not only that it's rejuvenating, but it's been a spiritual experience for me to, to participate and become um, and come to the conference. Hmm. So what is your? What can you tell us as a good story or a good storyteller? What do you look for? What do you look to project? And what do you look to see when you see other storytellers? Yes. A good storyteller is going to have a strong conviction about what it is they have to tell, and it's have to. Um, I oftentimes use the analogy of my daughter who suddenly gets this great idea and has to write it down real quick. It's almost like you've got to go to the bathroom or something bad's gonna happen. <laughs> and I think a storyteller, um, a good storyteller is one who has a deep conviction about putting out a message that needs to be heard a message or something that needs to be said. And so, um, and secondly, presence. But presence is going to happen. You know, we talk about presence, how to present yourself, and all of that's important and that's good. But presence in the conviction, and, and as um, I've heard other storytellers talk about uh, um, being true to yourself, when that comes out, presence is going to be known. Presence is going to be known and it's going to project itself to the audience. And they know you, they feel you before you even speak. So secondly, a good story is a story that's told from the heart. And it's told from the conviction of what it is that you have to say. And um, I would further say that I think, um, I, I learned that as a storyteller, I think about four years into storytelling when I came upon the story Tree Children. And um, I saw, I read the story first, and then after I, um, after I read the story, I knew, exact, I knew immediately that it was a story that I had to tell. Not that I wanted to tell it. It was one that I had to tell, because it touched something inside of me that said, it must speak. And maybe we're speaking the spirits of yesterday the spirits and ancestors who wanted, who had something to say or hadn't said it, and they're speaking to us now, leaving yourself open to that and speaking clearly and not holding it back. That makes a good storytelling and a good story. Thanks, Ramon. Yeah. Thanks. When I'm telling stories, I'm always talking to God, no matter who, no matter what level it is, because there is. You're a beautiful woman, beautiful body, beautiful face, but I'm talking to something in you past this physical beauty. It, this is beyond a word. Some call it God, some call it the spirit, some call it the soul, they call it the mind, the force, the being, but I'm talking to that. And that's always listening and watching and checking me out. Now look, if you say to somebody, God, the person listening is listening and so what are they checking this? They're checking you out. You're checking me out right now because lots of lots of people jive artists. Phony. No, phony. What, what's that on your hand, Brother Blue? What's that on your hand? What do you have inside your palm of your hand? 
Do you see that? Oh. What do you call that, darling? Now, you know, that's a butterfly. Why do you think I wear it? I don't know. Look like you could, like, make a tattoo or make a, it's a stamp. Oh, she's so cute. Huh? Is it a stamp? Listen, my darling. Mm -hmm. A fellow here asked me, why you, what's, why you wear the butterfly? You met the guy who's a big, strong, black brother. The kind I like, because he's really street, you know. <laughs> I said, listen, you're a strong dude. Strong and healthy, you got a nice quiet weight voice, manner, and everything. And I'm sure women like you. And a lot of men would like to have that physique, sturdy, healthy. But there's something inside you. There's more beautiful than the external. If a beautiful woman is constantly played to, and people tell her how beautiful she, beautiful she is, she's going to begin to think that that's her whole existence, is her physical beauty. Now, past this external. There's something surpassing this beauty. This body, we're going to drop it someday. Everybody has got to die. Mm -hmm. Now, the first time you saw a caterpillar, before you understood that they turned into butterflies, could you have guessed this crawling thing, Johnny green, some green, whatever the color it is, you, you probably wouldn't imagine if this thing would turn into this most, of the things on this earth, Butterfly is one of the most exquisite expressions of nature. Now, that progress from the caterpillar to the butterfly is called metamorphosis. It's the perfect parable, metaphor for our existence. Inside of this body, which we wear for a short time, then we shed it like uh, Dust. The, the caterpillar sheds the cocoon, out comes the butterfly, which is like unbelievable beauty. So is it, is it with us humans. We all are wearing these garments. They're like snow. They melt in many colors. Mm -hmm. But past these colors, visible to the natural eye, there's something which the natural eye cannot see. It's the color of love. What's the color of love? Natural eye can't even see it. It's a feeling. It's a, and there's something in you, something in blue, past words, communicating. See, I think this, when I say I'm talking to God, I'm talking to something past what the mind can, can articulate, that which is beyond words. They call it the ineffable or the, or the epiphany, like you feel something like sacred. See, it's checking me out. Now, I'm talking to that. And if they're talking to that, you forget about being successful, about getting a standing applause, or you're just trying to... That's another thing extreme. People use the word love a lot, you know. I was talking with a, with a lady downstairs. Do you, tell, do you tell love stories? In all my stories, I'm saying, I love you. Oh, I'm saying okay. to you, I love you. Now, the word, people use the word carelessly, you know. This word it's love. True. It's such a great I, I word. Agree. There's a love you, I, you I, you've probably said it. You say, well, I love you because you, well, you got my blood, you know, you're in my family, you got, I, you got the eyes of my mother there in my son. A lot of love I'm talking about is, if you believe in God, how would God love a person? That's the kind of love you should have as a storyteller. So you can love the person who hates you. By the way, I go to a lot of prisons. You, Ruth, and I go to prisons. Mm -hmm. Now, I may go to a place where some guys in there, skinheads, they don't even like black people. You're getting up in the morning, for whatever, to guess this, to go to this place. Go to the, try to get there in the first place. And then you go in that place, and they may not like you, but you should talk to them as though past the accident of birth, you talk to them under the power of this, we'll call it God, the force, and you talk to that inside that person. Now, it's not, it's not within, but by the way, it's past human love as we know it. There's a love, well, I can tell you another thing. You like animals? Yes. A lot? Yes. Do you have any animal pets? I have a lizard named Iggy. I kind of like that. I think we can make it. I like, I like animals. Now look, if you're telling a story to a dog, how do you tell a story to a dog? Just, just to, let's play around, but all oh, cat. What do, you, what do you want, cat or dog? Well, I like dog. I'm a, I'm a dog person. I'm a, I'm a dog. Yeah, I'm a dog. I am I, a dog. Yeah. D-A-W-G. Yeah. Could you like me as I am? I have a story called uh, The First Dog. 
You were a dog that ever was. It goes something like this here. Once upon a time, there was no dogs. There was no world, there was no earth, there was no sun, there was no stars. Before time or space, in a place, there was God. Not manifest, the idea of God. And I was tight with that, the idea of God. I was a little, because you see, God is so cool. God knew he got to have somebody around to witness what he's doing, because they ain't going to believe the stuff he's going to do, you see. But God lived back there, he's dreaming. That's right. God dreamed. <laughs> Every morning I'm up, just before sunrise, John, this morning I got up around, I don't know what time, but I generally will try to get up just before the sun rises, and I face the east, and I kneel, and I have this chalice, it's the chalice we use for our communion, and I get some water, generally tap water, sometimes filtered, sometimes not, maybe a grape. And as the sun is rising, I'm on my knees, and I drink this water, eat this grape, or a piece of bread, and I consecrate that food and breath, my life, the food I drink, the liquid I, I the food I eat, the liquid I drink, Constant, translate that, my life, what's left of my life or my mind, to living the story. What's the story? The human being who loves with unconditional love a stranger. And then you're praying that you will take this food and drink and convert that into some kind of energy to tell a story and an idea will come to you that will bless the people. Now I say in the morning, I may go out on the street. I may, I may want to go out to the Harvard Square. I've been working the streets since 1968. I used to do it all barefoot. What would you like to say? Our founders are Linda Goss, Charlotte Blake Austin, Jawara. This is what I feel. I'm going to say it. I love these people. I love them the way a grandfather would love his grandchildren. Because they're about something so beautiful. Now, we don't have any children of our own. But these, if I had children and grandchildren, I'd like them to be like this, on the case, trying to do the work. Because the same darling, each of us must be the one we're looking for. Whatever you conceive of a human being coming into this world to do some good work, to go about touching human hearts, in this time where people are fighting over the color of the skin on their religion, the human being who loves with a love, there's a Jewish term, I don't know if you heard the term, mensch, it's the human being who loves. Generally, this person may not have a religion or may have a religion, but just has the natural instinct to do the noble right thing. If no one were even looking, if there were no reward for being good and just, she or he comes in the world to work for justice, for some kind of truth, for some kind of understanding and love among people, not for any reward, because this is a decent human being and brave. So, for instance, you're walking down the street, and you see this bag lady, at least you're going to look at that person. It's going to come through you somehow, regard for this human being. And feel something for her like you might feel for your mother if she were in that condition. It's like a, it's a human being who does the righteous thing and in the desperate situation is fair. Who will lay her or his life down for you because it's the right thing to do. Get past the accident of birth. Past your particular gender, past your particular religion, past your particular ethnicity. You're, you, you're acting as though you're here to change the world. It's just it's the idea. You want to do it. And if you do it with your whole being, powers will come to you. Every time you eat, you're taking this food in. What can I do with this food? Can I turn it into a good story? In your thoughts, in your mind, first I must live the story. We're all looking for that. The human being, just like, do you remember in your lifetime going uh, to a on a, going on a blind date, going to meet someone, you hoping this will be the meeting. We're all hoping to see someone in this world who is like, here's some truth walking on. I mean, it's just truth. It's goodness. This person may belong to church, may not, but this person is like truth, kind. Is this person not aware that she is just a natural human being? Mm -hmm. Walking down the street, if you would see a flower, you wouldn't step on the flower. And because if you would, you would do the righteous thing. At the same time, 
you realize that the war was the church. The sky is, 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 the, is the top of this cathedral. Every, when you see a dog, you help the dog. You're seeing, looking past all everything outside, seeing something in people that is holy. So everything you do, you do as though this would change life on the planet. Because we're in bad shape right now. People, this whole idea of ethnic cleansing, by the way. This idea of the, 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 the traumas people are going through, the things happening in the world. So you, you take it upon yourself, like I'm with you. Past this particular interview, I'm trying to encourage human beings to help us realize we belong to the human family. And one way to do that, by the way, is to find out what's in your culture. If we can share cultures, one thing about storytelling is you get inside a culture. This person is longer a stranger or distant to you because you find out there's something we share as human beings. We come in this world hoping somebody will love us, hoping that someone that we love will love us back. We live for a short time, hoping they have children that we love. Then we got to drop the body. Everybody's got to die. Now, in that short time between birth and death, what can we do that's wonderful in this world? It can be very harsh, especially if you're poor. You're concerned with some kind of justice. I'm always thinking, what do the poor people do who don't have access to stuff? You find them on the street. I spent a lot of my time in streets. I started in 68 working streets, barefoot. I used to go to a jail every weekend. While I was at Harvard, it was all my friends were in jail. I'd go out there, bring them anything. I do it now. I mean, if I go to a lecture and it's great, I'll take that thing in the street and break it down for those people. There's something inside of us we often don't know ourselves. But we're hoping to go past the external and see something in a human being which is of such worth that you encounter that with absolute attention. Like, I do a lot of storytelling in jails. I used to go every week to a jail. When I'm going to tell a, to talk to a guy in a jail, and we're gonna, I go to meet him, we're gonna, I'm gonna listen, listen, I'm gonna share stories. Before I go, first I prepare myself in my heart and my mind so that I come to this person looking for that inside the person which has passed uh, the particular offense this person has committed. As God would look at a human being, yo, what's happening? How you doing, sir? I'm sorry, right I had on, some ladies asking okay, to come in here. As God would look at a human being, seeing everything in that human being, as a, as a parent, you have children, right, kid? Yes. Well, you know, this baby, when the baby was first born, by the way, when I was doing, I used to do a lot of workshops at Harvard, uh, I was, I was a field education supervisor at Harvard Divinity School, and then when they have children, they'd come to meet these students and say, Blue, tell a story to a baby in the womb. And so I'm talking to that baby in the womb. Just to talk to that baby, it's got to be something past my small mind what's happened to that baby the right way. After the baby's born, I go to the hospital, they put the baby in my hands. Every time I'm telling a story, I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to heal the world. More than entertain, sometimes laughter is what we well, Brother Blue, you, you, you are healing the world. What's that, darling? You are healing the world. I, I, I please, by the way, if any, if you've ever discussed with me, you got to mention Ruth. She's yeah. my angel. She's good. I try to be good. Yeah. She's true. I try to be truthful. Yeah. And you know, I'm just translating this one. But now, she's the real thing, and I do my little street obligato yeah. around her. Because yeah. I've met her, and she's like, she, she commands. And I'll be honest. Good, true. Because you know what I have to look well, at her eyes. You're very blessed. Her eyes, I guess. I said you're blessed to have her. In a way. Yeah. By the way, I think you have some of that quality in you. Otherwise, you wouldn't. You wouldn't even be bothered with me. With me, if you if you didn't have that thing in you, you wouldn't pay any attention to me. Because I'm sort of a fool for love, you know. Thank you so much. You. My name is Karima. I'm Eve, and I'm a storyteller from Buffalo, New York. I am a founding member of. Spinner Storytellers of Western New York and Tradition Keepers, Black Storytellers of Western New York. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Oh, Can't great. tell you how good it's been. <laughs> okay. We here is the National Association of Black Storytellers. 18th? 18th annual. 18th yeah. annual conference. This yes, is wonderful. It's beautiful. Well, Kareem, I hear you say black storytellers, and mm -hmm. one of the questions we were wondering is why is the need for a black storytelling mm -hmm. as opposed to just storytelling, you know, because we have some issues with European storytelling, although they don't advertise themselves as European, right. usually that's what the majority of them is. So why do you think it's important that we have a black storytelling? Uh, I think it's real important that people know exactly who we are 
and exactly what we do and exactly what our mission is and that our mission is clear. It's important for us to tell our own stories. Um, no one else can do it like we can do it. And if we fail in that mission and don't tell our own stories and make it clear that it is us and that we are telling our stories, eventually someone else will come along to tell our stories. And you can believe they're not going to do us any justice. You know, if someone else is telling your story, they will tell it in a way that benefits them. They will tell it from their perspective. And it's real important that we share our story, that we tell our story. Hmm. So what would you say is a um, good story? What makes a good story? What makes a good storyteller? Hmm. How, how the link, how does that come together? Yeah. yeah. I think a good story is a story that makes you feel something. Um, when I'm looking for a story, whether I'm looking inside of myself or looking in a book or listening to other tellers, a good story for me is a story that makes me feel something. It makes me laugh or it makes me cry or it makes me smile or it makes me think or it makes me feel like I gotta get up and, and go tell somebody. Uh, in fact, oftentimes that's what I'll do. I'll find a good story. I have to call one of my children or call the cat Smokey or call somebody and say, listen to this story. This is really a great story and tell the story. You know, now if I'm want to, wanting to perfect it for a performance, then of course I have to keep telling it and telling it and, and working on it and practicing it and sharing it with various, share it with various audiences. But I think the, the good story is the story that makes you feel something. Uh, maybe it makes you angry. Maybe that's a story you still need to tell. If it makes you feel something, perhaps it should be your story. Mm -hmm. So what is, your, what is your favorite audience? Do you have oh, a favorite boy, type? Boy. I mean, because people say, oh, I'm not going to do children. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know. Yeah. Whatever, I can't do all elders. You know, is there a certain type of story, a certain style, or your audience you know, that you take, um, bring to your audience? Six years ago, I decided to make this my full-time vocation. It's what I do to pay the mortgage and to send my children to school and to uh, keep my car rolling. And um, the stories, what was the question again? <laughs> well, the story was, what is your favorite audience? Oh, okay, audience my audience, yes. And how, what, yeah. yeah, well, for the most part, before I decided to make this a full-time occupation. I was working mostly with schools, libraries, and bookstores. But for the last six years, I've got audiences of uh, adults and children, uh, all different ages. You know, I think I had an in, in vitro audience, you know, uh, mothers who are about to have children. And my whole thing is that you begin to tell your stories to your children even before they come. So I had an audience of pregnant moms, and I told stories to them and to their children. The oldest person I've ever had in an audience that I know of was 109, you know? And I thought the man was sleeping. He was sitting in the wheelchair, his eyes were closed, but when the program was over, he had a million questions. He was really listening. Not just hearing me, but really listening. And he had some good questions. So I find myself telling to all kinds of audiences in a variety of places from the schools, the libraries, the bookstores, and the museums, to businesses, um, yeah, I've told with the Philharmonic, uh, hospitals, prisons. I do a lot of prison work because I really believe that everyone's a storyteller and that storytelling belongs everywhere. So I find myself going to a lot of different places. And I really can't think of an audience that I have a preference for. Uh, I used to think when I was teaching, especially in the beginning years, that the 11th and 12th graders I worked with were the best. And then I had to work with 7th and 8th graders, and I worked with them forever, and I thought they were the best. And then I started telling stories to lots of different audiences, and all of my audiences are the best. Even when things don't go according to plan, I think I learned something from every situation. So when you're learning, um, what do you think you teach in your stories? Well, you know, you never know what you're teaching. Um, you never know what people sometimes are getting out of a story. Perhaps you have a point you want to make or a moral that you would like to express or an idea of what you want this child or this adult to walk away with, but sometimes they see and hear things that you don't necessarily intend. Uh, I may take a story and tell it for 10 years. There are stories I've been telling for that long and longer, and oftentimes someone will come up to me after a performance and say, you know, while you were telling this story, I was thinking about that to that. I go, whoa, you know, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. um, I never took the story there. And oftentimes, someone in your audience can give you a new idea, a fresh idea about how a story can be told differently. 
and you might even embrace that new idea and try it with an audience and see how it works. So the stories are always evolving and always changing and always in a state of flux. I like to think that when people hear me tell the story um, that they may be entertained, that they may learn something new, that they will have something to think about and that I can give them something that's worth passing on. Okay. Well, you use passing on. That's a good segue because passing on, mm -hmm. one of the questions that we were wondering is passing on, passing on. What is the purpose of passing it on? Why do you feel it's important to really pass it on, these stories, mm -hmm. to, to people? You know, if you're not passing them on, then they're going to die. Uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey was one who said that a people without knowledge of their history, without knowledge of their story, is like a tree without roots. And you know a tree without roots dies. And so too will a people who don't pass on what they've learned, what they've experienced. Uh, I grew up without any living grandparents, but I know them. I know my great-grandparents. None of them were alive when I was growing up. Um, they had all, they were all, you know, had made their transition before I was born. But I know them. And I know them through the stories that my mother and father told. Uh, I know what they valued. I know the kind of work they did. Uh, I know the kinds of education they received, um, and not necessarily formal education. You know, um, I know uh, the kind of spirit they had. You know, I know what a fighter my mother's mother, my great grandmother was. Uh, I also know what a comedian she was. You know, and I'm so pleased that my parents saw fit to pass on this information to me. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I think you can learn from everything, and that you can learn from everybody. So, uh, you know, it uh, allows life to keep moving on. Langston Hughes wrote a poem, you know, called Still Here. Mm -hmm. I've been scarred and I've been battered. My hopes mm -hmm. the wind done scattered. Mm -hmm. Snow has frizzed me, sun has baked me. Looks like between them they done tried to make me stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. But I don't care. I'm still here. And I'm here because somebody saw fit to live and to love and to pass it on. So I grow, and I am, because they were, you know. I'm not just here by myself. Uh, I'm the legacy of a whole bunch of folks who saw fit to love each other and to pass it on, whatever it was, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thanks, Dean. Oh, you're welcome. Hello, my name is Diane Williams, and I'm a storyteller. I've been telling stories for about eight years, almost nine years. I live in Madison, Mississippi. Oh, hi, Diane. How are you? Fine. Good. We're here at the National Association of Black Storytellers Festival and Conference. And I am here to ask you, to our Keepers of the Culture audience, what do you think makes a good story? I think a good story is told by someone that uses, by large, by that basically uses their personality and their character in their storytelling. And what type of stories do you like to tell? I like to tell all kinds of stories. I don't have any one type of story that I like more than any other type of story. Okay. What do you think, uh, what would you have to say to any new and upcoming storytellers? What kind of advice would you like to give someone who's new in the business? I would encourage them to listen to other storytellers, but I would also encourage them to just listen to people talk. And? I don't have anything to do. I've been having <laughs> such a good time at What's this Matthew? festival <laughs> that my mind is filled with the stories that I've heard this weekend. I personally, I can't be interviewed right now. Family concert is going on. That's what's important to me. Down in Mississippi, we call it junkin', just jankin'. And I don't want to sit here right now and talk to the camera. I want to hear more and more stories. That's what's important to Diane Williams. I love listening to other storytellers more than anything else. I got my listening ears on and I'm ready. Yeah, I like to tell stories too. And I have some favorites today and tomorrow I may have another favorite. But right now, everybody in the other room, they're my favorites. I wanna give them my undivided attention. I wanna give them applause. I wanna give them my heart. That's what I like. 
Diane, you are free. Thank you. Bye. That's me, for real. Hey, Victorine Jackson, how you doing, sis? I am marvelous. Okay, Victorine marvelous. just won the Creative Tall Tale. Well, we call it Liars Contest. Come on, Come on <laughs> Make, it plain, okay. Make it plain, Make it plain, Okay. <laughs> How'd you think of that story, girl? You know, that was just like divine inspiration. Okay. I was in a workshop hey. or something yesterday, okay. and it was just dropped in my spirit. I heard that. I, I heard said, that. I wonder if somebody ever told that one. <laughs> Whoa. You were good. I loved it. I loved it. Congratulations. Thank you much. All right. So, listen, you're a storyteller. How long have you been telling stories? Um, well, now, I'm a public librarian, so I've been telling stories a long time, but I never associated it with storytelling. Right, right, And right. Uh, my co-worker is Sharon Jordan Holly, uh -huh. was Sharon Jordan Holly when I lived in Buffalo, New York. Right, right. And um, she introduced me to storytelling. She okay. introduced me to myself. I heard that. Yeah, I, I was heard very that. miseducated. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. like most of us Come were. On. That's I right. I bachelor's degree. I was a bad girl. Yeah, right, Didn't right, know right. Nothing. Didn't know nothing. I heard that. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing, <laughs> honey. <laughs> Nothing. I heard that. <laughs> then I went to high school, and I went to a high school that was um, the mother of the magnet school. You know, it really, you know, I was a, a fairly decent student, you know, mm -hmm. really good, you know, mm -hmm. considering that I was, you know, with, you know, really very, 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 very intelligent people. Mm -hmm. um, went to undergrad, finished in three years, mm -hmm. um, went to graduate school, finished, mm -hmm. you know, in time. I mean, you know, I was very educated, but like I said, I didn't know anything about myself. Mm -hmm. And that is, that was, that was really the missing, the thing that, that made me incomplete. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you mm -hmm. know, um, and um, when I, you know, started being introduced to myself, it was, it was, it was, it was, it just opened my eyes. So did someone tell you a story about, or how did, how were you introduced to yourself? Well, were you told a story? Did you read a story? Well, how I was introduced to myself was just on just getting some history. You know, Sharon, you know, told me about all these black folk that had did all this stuff. And I was like, what? What? I mean, my black heroes and sheroes was, you know, my aunts and my uncles and my grandmother and, you know, and, and they are, they still remain my sheroes and my heroes. But to know that there were black people who had actually, you know, been written down in history and had, had done things that had, like, moved and shook up this world. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, it was awesome. I had never heard that before. Mm -hmm. And and it was that history that, you know, I mean, coupled with, 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 you know, you know, my desire for truth, because I didn't even know the Lord then, but I, I wanted to know the truth. Mm -hmm. I was seeking truth. I was right. seeking it everywhere. And, mm -hmm. and it was the history and, and then the, the fine, you know, then Sharon was telling like folk tales and, mm -hmm. and it just started just Sharon opening him. up. Sharon Jordan, Ho Sharon Holly okay. in Buffalo, New York. Okay. I love her. Okay. Oh my goodness. Right. And then I found them, you know, just different folk tales. And I found that, you know, wow, when I read them, it's like I knew the characters. I mean, I knew people that, oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And there's certain stories I tell, and I tell you, if I was to tell those stories around certain people, they'd know. But they'd know it was them. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I just lifted up their character and different, you know, you know, their personality, personalities and different things they did and just infuse them into different characters. So it's like, I don't, it's like I know the characters. I know them so personally, and, and it just... It, it, it's a way, you know, to teach. So even if it's not, um, you know, you're teaching about a historical figure, you can still teach by, you know, just drawing out that which is you. Right. I mean, even in the way in the way you deliver it. Right. You know, some people, you know, they're very astute and they speak and they're very clear and they're. Some people have their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth and they, you know. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But me, it was like, you know, I, I found myself kind of like switching. You know, if, it, if the majority of the people in the room was, you know, one color, you know, I, I made sure that my diction was clear because, you know, I didn't want them to follow along. But then it was like, wait a minute. Mm -mm. I got to give it. I got to right. give it, you know, like I know it. I got to give it like my grandmother mm -hmm. gave it to me and like mm -hmm. my auntie gave it to me. and it And it meant that they were better able to receive because what I gave them was truth. Yeah. What I gave them was truth. I mean, and it was like, you know, what's that saying? Um, uh, 
fetch it like you catch it like you fetch it. <laughs> right. Maybe, you know, yeah. come, come on, on now on. and once and once. So it's it's like it's it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's a process, and it's like ever evolving. And and I love it because our our history and what we are it's it's forever. I mean, the deeper you get in, the further you go in, and it's just beautiful. Yeah, it is. It really is, and so are you. Well, thank you, know, you. <laughs> thank you. You know, we were talking, you were sharing with me earlier about, you know, finding stories and the reason the stories are so important, and you were you were referring to one of the greatest books ever written. So, oh, yeah, Gloria. Gloria. that's right. So let's, <laughs> let's, you know, so if you would like to share on that, on, on, on the stories, why they're so important to us, why our storytellers are so important, and writing it down, who, I mean, just think, if none of the brothers in ancient times, never wrote it down. Who would have known about the greatest storyteller there ever was? And it was it was divinely inspired. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you said, you know, people ask, well, how long did it take you to make up that that mm -hmm. lie? It was it was divine. Mm -hmm. and I was in a workshop and it was just dropped in my spirit, mm -hmm. and I knew that that was what I was I right. was, I had to do it. And I sat there watching all the liars up there. And I was like, oh my gosh, why did I sign up? But it was like I knew, you know, just right, go right, and do right, what right. was put in your spirit to right, do. Right. And um, you know, I serve in in, in the children's ministry mm -hmm. at at at, at uh, my church home, and it just blessed me so because I I use stories to to teach, you know, I, you know, forever teaching with it. And one day I was like just reading through, you know, the Bible, and and it was like I read this for the first time where Jesus' disciples asked him, you know, why you. You know, he had already, he had just gave the parable of the sower, and and they were asking him, you know, why do you why do you tell stories? Why do you tell people stories? And he was saying that, you know, how he was telling his disciples how they've been giving insight into God's way of doing things. Mm -hmm. You've been giving insight. You mm -hmm. know how to do it, mm -hmm. and that's how some story, you know storytellers are. They know different things, mm -hmm. you know, from your study and, and from what's mm -hmm. been revealed to you, you know. But there are some people who don't know. Mm -hmm. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears that they mm -hmm. can't hear. And there's and there's nothing, no force there that will turn them around and make them stop doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's why you have, like, you know, brothers like Baba Jamal and, and, and Kala Jojo and, and, praise God, Teju, mm -hmm. who can go into, like, penal institutions mm -hmm. and you know these these I mean be around people who can't see who can't hear you know who have not who has nothing to, to make them stop doing what they're doing and, and turn around but they can they can mm -hmm. through their stories mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they're, what they're telling is truth and they're delivering it in, in love and and that's really what what, what Jesus did mm -hmm. you know that's really what he did mm -hmm. oh well I'm telling you and let's not forget brother blue oh the original brother, prism oh, later. Now you're gonna make me jump up out of my chair. I want brother blue. Don't think brother that. blue and sister Ruth. Oh right, my goodness. Right. And we're so blessed to right, have them. Right. Mama Mary and and, and, and and praise God Linda Goss. You right. know and in the Bible too it says to give honor where honor is due and and, and you just got to. Right. But I, I do believe that it's time that we as storytellers, you know, um, Get, get a hold of that mm -hmm. and not just give honor with our mouth but to give honor to bless them mm -hmm. give them some money when you see them give them some money it's like plant you you have a seed you plant it mm -hmm. if it's good ground you plant it if you know the ground is good and you plant a seed something mm -hmm. good gonna grow mm -hmm. out of it mm -hmm. when we see them it's like let's give honor to them let's not just talk about them mm -hmm. they're here with us now mm -hmm. you know they won't always be right. this festival will be going on for years and years but they won't be here with mm -hmm. us now so while they're here Bless them. Give them some money. You know, like you say, honor your mother and father. They ain't just talking about saying nice things Take to them. good care it's, of them. It's give Take them some care. money. Right. <laughs> Not just okay. make sure they just got what they need. Give, give them, them some, some money. Right. You know, so right. I guess that's just how I feel. You know, and I and I set my I set my heart this year. I'm bringing them some money. Yeah. I'm going to put Support it in the hand. You know, and it's like right. this year it ain't as much as I, you know, would have liked, but I know.